be able to give his talk, uh, his ideas, and our research centre's ideas on the way we're going with antibiotic dosing and a paradigm change in the way we prescribe antibiotics. And the way I'm going to do it is to look at effect, the effect of antibiotic uh, regimes or dosing. I'm going to look at uh, intensive care unit pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. I'm going to show you that we are chronically underdosing. I'm going to show you how we can get better at dosing, and then I'm going to give you some take-home points. So let's start on effective dosing. There's a whole group of single center studies and a few repeat studies showing that the higher the dose of aminoglycoside, Cmax to MIC, the better the outcome. Here's another study, higher the dose, the better the outcome. With carbapenems, if you keep the MIC, the Cmin to MIC ratio of five, they're better outcomes. That's quite a high dose. With cephalosporins, if you keep the time above MIC of 100%, the, the C-min above MIC, the full duration of the study, Peggy McKinnon showed better outcomes. Alan Forrest many years ago showed the AUIC of 125 for quinolones had better outcomes than if the AUIC was less. Cheryl, uh, one of the Canadian uh, uh, Zelenetsky actually uh, showed that if you keep the AUIC of vancomycin above 400, and particularly 450, you get better vancomycin outcomes. And then there's the Nazalet study, the high dose, again, AUIC of 85 or greater, better outcomes, and the same with tigacycline, the free fraction AUIC of greater than roughly one produced better outcomes. So there's a lot of evidence coming through in the background, probably level three evidence, and they'll be coming level two evidence soon, that the higher, the, the, the dosing of a higher regime is better for outcomes. Now, if there's one thing you take home from this talk, it's this slide here. The way medicine has designed studies and, regi and registration, particularly via the FDA, is that a compound may be found in animals, or in mouse, or in test tube these days. And if it kills the mice, obviously the compound is dead. So they look at toxicity. They then try and estimate dosing from that and put it into human volunteers. And those human volunteers aren't sick, but they're really looking for toxicity. If the human volunteers have side effects, they can't release the drug. They then take the pharmacokinetics and the dosing of human volunteers and the predicted dosing from animals and put it into phase two relatively non-sick patients. And there may or may not be efficacy if they're infected or not. But again, they're looking for side effects. If there are no side effects, it may be efficacious, it may be equal to other antibiotics, they then release a package insert. And your regulations are to use that package insert. Most of us by now should be using off-label aminoglycosides. Single daily or high, high uh, extended interval dosing of aminoglycosides, which is off-label. And we're not using, we shouldn't be using amikacin or aminoglycosides in general according to the package insert. So you get this package insert and you say X amount of kefir whatever a day. Well, in ICU, the pharmacokinetics and the drug distribution and the dosing is different. And it's not difficult to see. This is not the same as a phase two study in which the dosing was, was released. So ICU is different. And you've seen a lot of these uh, pictorial diagrams before. We published the first one in 2009, but we've added to that that in critical illness, there will be a hyperdynamic group with increased clearances. There will be increased volume of distribution because the massive fluids we give to resuscitate. And you'll have to have higher doses to get adequate levels. There will be low plasma concentrations. There will be renal dysfunction and or hepatic dysfunction that may need to make you decrease the dose. And on top of that, we think we're cleverer in the ICU, and in a lot of ways we are. We add extra corporeal circuits, which make the dosing even more complicated. 
We did a point prevalence study in Europe, 68 ICUs, looking at what levels come out of the patient. In other words, no matter what dose was used, we just asked for levels. And you can see it's not unexpected because of all of this that levels range by 100-fold across ICUs uh, in the DALI study. I'll come back to that study later. So there's really little dosing in ICU for many of our patients. And we may think we can dose the, the relatively common ICU patient, but then there's a transplant plant patient, there's a burns, obese, pediatric patients have a problem. With significant organ function, uh, dysfunction, there may be problems. And then we add the extracorporeal circuits. Now, when you give an inotrope, you can titrate the amount you give to the pharmacodynamic endpoint of blood pressure. You can indirectly measure blood glucose and give insulin according to the blood glucose and see the effect. You can't see the pharmacodynamic effect of antibiotics. The PD effect is masked, and it takes days for the PD effect to be aware. But there is a key relationship between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. The PKPD relationship is important. And I'll come on to PD in a minute, but there are two big pharmacokinetic differences in the ICU. The first one is an increased volume of distribution, particularly of hydrophilic antibiotics. The hydrophilic antibiotics go where that extravascular water goes. Patients swell up because we give them three, four liters of fluid and they swell up and the, the antibiotics, well, the hydrophilic antibiotics go where the water goes. That's like filling up the bathtub. But the bathtub has a plug that is really clearance. There's increased clearance in ICU as well. And here are some studies just illustrating that. As Rithromycin, uh, I'm sorry, 15% increase in volume of distribution, oh, sorry, in clearance, keftriaxone, huge increases in clearance and volume of distribution, daptomycin, ertapenem, they all, all these hydro, hydrophilic antibiotics will have an increased volume of distribution and because they're all renally cleared, will have an increased clearance in those patients that have so-called normal creatinines. And you've got to fill up that increased volume of distribution Otherwise, you're going to get a, de de a delay to adequate antibiotic treatment. And here with the Erosme group, we found the package insert of vancomycin says you give one gram BD. Here we found that we had to give 35 milligrams per kilogram as a loading dose. You may want to give 30, but you have to give, for a 70 kilogram person, you need at least two grams loading to fill up your bathwater spaces, to fill up the extra spaces for vancomycin. Here's a very important Greek study looking at colistin, which has got the same, pharma, same distribution uh, pharmacokinetics as vancomycin. If you gave three million units, you'd get this type of curve and there'll be a delay to adequate levels. Whereas if you give a whopping nine, milli, nine million units loading, you'll get to the optimum level virtually immediately, and there's the peak as well. You need the 9 million loading to fill up all the spaces of that extravascular water. Otherwise, you may debate time to antibiotics, but it should be time to adequate antibiotics. So you've got to give a loading dose when you start of the hydrophilic antibiotics, the aminoglycosides, the glycopeptides, colistin, and to, to some extent, the beta-lactams as well. I can't stress enough, the loading dose is independent of the maintenance dose. It's like the bath water and the plug. You fill up the bath water contents, independent of the clearance, independent of how quickly the bath water empties. So you volume load, particularly the hydrophilic antibiotics. The lipophilic is slightly different. And then you look at your maintenance dose. Now, we did two studies, one on kefapine and one on kefpyrone, and it just so happened that the kefpyrone patients seemed to have lower levels 
than the kefepine. Then we put the two together because they're the same type of drug. They release, they excrete it through the kidneys the same and they work the same. And we showed that creatinine clearance on this axis is not unexpectedly relates to drug clearance. So you and I, as we sit here, have a creatinine clearance of about 100 mils a minute. And we have drug clearance. We know that this part of the curve is correct, and we, we've looked at that for many years. If there's renal dysfunction, there'll be drug accumulation, and you have to decrease the dose. But what was, in, what was fascinating to see and important to see that there are some patients in ICU have creatinine clearances 250, 300 mils a minute much higher than you and I. If you've got high creatinine clearance, you'll have high drug clearance of renally cleared drugs. And we arbitrarily said one standard deviation above 120, which is the upper limit, one standard deviation above it, we called augmented renal clearance. With augmented renal clearance, you get high drug clearance. If you get high drug clearance, you get low trough levels. And we then published trough level versus creatinine clearance, we had to publish it. It's a no-brainer, right? The higher the creatinine clearance, the higher the drug clearance, the lower the trough for the same dose. And here's at least one study that we found, single observational center, showing that the drug failure is higher in patients with augmented renal clearance because the trough is much lower. They haven't got adequate antibiotics. Look at this DALI data again. That group over there is significantly underdosing, no matter what parameter you use, at a trough level. So that's pharmacokinetics, and that's to some extent dosing. Let's just look at the pharmacodynamics of the antibiotics. And their various kill characteristics, which is the pharmacodynamics, there's time above MIC, the beta-lactams, the non-concentration or time-dependent antibiotics, the concentration-dependent antibiotics, high peak amikacin or aminoglycoside to MIC of 10 you need, peak to MIC of 10. And then there's a combination of AUC over MIC, which is the vancomycin, tigercycline, et cetera, linazolid. So when you look at PKPD, you're really looking at drug level versus MIC. And we can measure the drug level, the PK, and it's relatively accurate a lot of the time. But just let's look at the PD, the denominator of that graph, or of that equation. A lot of the work started off in Bill Craig's unit in the States, and he's the doyen of PKPD. And this comes from one of his papers, uh, a repeat of other studies showing that you need a time in a mouse model. This is not ICU, a mouse model. You need time above MIC of 60 to 80% for optimum killing. So time above MIC, the optimum killing is around here. But what this study also showed is if the MIC was less than one, there was an 80% success. If the MIC was two, there was less. As the MIC went up, so the success rate was less. So with higher MICs and decreased susceptibility of organisms in some ICUs, you may have to raise the, the PK to get the PKPD relationship. And here's some German surveillance data showing that, that the carbapenem MICs are significantly higher within the ICU, which is not an uncommon phenomenon. And on top of that, the MICs may be inaccurate. There's overall bacterial uh, it depends on your inoculum size. There's a high standard deviation. I'll come on to this study in a minute. There's interstrain variability and biological variation. If any of you are working in this area, I advise you to read this article by Johan Maton and colleagues. What they basically showed is if you are an accredited lab with a standard way of measuring your MICs, and you get an MIC today of one, and take the same methodology with the same laboratory technique and the same lab technicians, the next day, you can have a two-fold variation in MIC. 
even the, in the accredited lab with the relatively same way of doing things. So there's a variability, at least a twofold variability of MIC in the best hands. So the MIC is an inaccurate measurement. The, the PK, the pharmacokinetics is accurate, but the PD, you have to take into account various variabilities. So let me point out the issues related to that. If this is a standard serum curve after a bolus dose with Cmax and Cmin, and theoretically that's your MIC. As the MICs go up, your time above MIC conceptually drops. Right? And that's partly why that Craig's article showed higher MICs, less out the worse outcome. But on top of this, if you add the variability of the MIC, you really need high concentrations to get optimum killing to cover not only rising resistance, but the variability in MIC. Now I'm gonna show you that we are chronically underdosing. Here's the daily dosing. We do this, we've had the same problem, where you give a dose and the patients with augmented renal clearance, and I haven't got the data here, 65% of patients that come into ICUs with a normal serum creatinine, 65% of patients that come in with a normal serum creatinine have augmented renal clearance. Augmental renal clearance will create trough levels that are particularly low. Here's the minimum MIC that we would ask for covering. We look at four or five times MIC for our trough, but you can see the significant across Europe and Australia, the, the low levels with standard dosing. Here's vancomycin variability. We want a level of 15. You can see below 15. Tycoplanin, significantly underdosing. Calistin, again, a lot of underdosing. And that's for microbiological cure. Jason Roberts has pointed out with a whole group of experts that not only have you got bacterial killing and clinical cure, but you want to try and suppress resistance as well, which is a separate phenomenon. So we are looking at clinical cure most of the time, but I'm gonna show you some problems with resistance development. There's this new technique that, that uh, Jason Roberts went to uh, Liverpool to learn and now is brought to Brisbane, where you can impregnate bacteria into a hollow fiber, grow the bacteria in that medium over days, and then perfuse various concentrations or combinations of drug through those holes. Hollow fiber infection model. So in the one experiment here, we looked at the in vitro infections of Pseudomonas, right? With an MIC of four over seven days. And we simulated renal function. You could control the input of the drug and the output of the drug to simulate creatinine clearances with a big inoculum size, or a reasonable inoculum size, and we looked at resistant and, and uh, normal populations. And here you can see, when there is, de in the standard dose, when there is renal dysfunction, the bacteria are killed because the concentration is high. But when you have creatinine clearances of 100 moles a minute, which is normal, or higher creatinine clearance, what happens is there may be an initial kill, but then the organisms regrow. Here, the, very little initial kill, but the organisms regrow because we are underdosing at creatinine clearances of 250 mils a minute. Here's a similar type of phenomena where colony forming units on that axis, increasing dose of propicillin on that axis, and you can see when we look at MRCs, it's a static, static phenomenon. So there's kill, this kill off you'd normally see in a normal curve over there. Just remember this is 12, 24, 36 hours. But look what happens at about 24 hours. There's often regrowth unless your concentration is very, very high. So su resistance suppression may need higher doses than the normal bacterial kill. And in this article here, we showed that you needed a, a five times MRC to prevent resistance 
or to, to, to prevent some of the high MIC bacteria from growing. And another article here shows that the same thing with meropenem. But here we showed that the organisms that regrow have a higher MIC than when we started with the initial organisms. In other words, it's survival of the fittest. The bacteria either mutate or the, the high resistant ones grow up and become the dominant colony. And unless you kill that dominant colony, the MICs of the meropenem are much higher than when you started. So how do we get better? Well, you use dosing nomograms, which I'll come on to in a minute, largely with beta-lactams and a lot of the antibiotics, renally-based dosing nomograms. There's going to be software, and there are already embedded population pharmacokinetics, and I'll show you some data. And then a lot of us, and there's more and more people now using therapeutic drug monitoring. I can send my drug level of meropenem level or Piptocillin has a back time level in the morning, and I get the result back in the afternoon. And then I adjust accordingly. And then you, there are papers, and I'll show you, where you can have TDM and then software that'll help you dose. So here's a nomogram of vancomycin. Right, there's the reference. Before, and there, 50% didn't achieve target. And after the nomogram, a lot more people achieved target. So there aren't that's vancomycin. Here, Jason is published with Dave Nicolau. Dosing software, largely based on renal function and body weight. So you take the renal function, the creatinine clearance, body weight, and you look at the dosing on this population PK paper. So embedded in the paper or software, if you want, as well, you can have, depending on creatinine clearance and weight, a dosing nomogram. And then there's a whole lot of papers, not from us only, but other papers, looking at therapeutic drug monitoring and their adaptive feedback depending on the level you get. Uh, Fred, Federico P from Italy, this is, uh, there's a whole lot of people doing this now, and I think that's the way we, we should be going. Right? And that's with all the antibiotics. And this is the, probably the, the, the most sophisticated dosing nomogram uh, from David Neely, and I think my time's over, but we are getting better d dosing nomograms. We are underdosing. We should be able to embed soon on an app dosing recommendations, and my take -home, the last take-home message is I think you should use higher doses at the moment if you can't measure than the standard doses, and I thank you for your time and attention.